Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take some data and use it to try to explain the world. I am Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, with you still in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. for one more week. After that, I will be back in Berlin, where Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is right now still for a little while. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, our data point this week is 0.8. That is in 0.8%, which is the increase in the GDP of China in the second quarter of this year compared to the first quarter. For some Western countries, that would mark a pretty good success. For China, it's a disappointment. And together with some other data, including over 20% unemployment for youth, slowing exports, etc. It all makes for a portrait of a country that seems not to have recovered from the pandemic in the way that many people expected. So yeah, we thought we'd dig into this slowdown in China and what exactly it amounts to. It's all part of our informal series uh, this month in August of country segments. We're touring the world in the next couple weeks. So yeah, stick with us for the rest of the month. But yeah, back to China. So Adam, you know, when it comes to this slowdown, I'm curious which of the kind of economic shocks, of which there seem to be several, seem to be playing the biggest role in this slowdown in China. I mean, is it the direct effects of the pandemic response? Obviously, we've all heard about zero COVID, this kind of radical halt to the economy in China. Is it kind of the effects of that that are still making a mark? Is it Xi Jinping's kind of general assertion of control over the country and the private sector? You know, he has obviously been a unparalleled or in in recent times a leader of China and has asserted control over the country. Or is it really shifts in Western economic policy towards China? Obviously, even just this past week, we had the United States imposing new investment controls in terms of Western investments in China. So, yeah, which of these kind of economic shifts is playing the biggest role? Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense, at least, you know, on the face of it, to look for a, a shock like this. Um, to, to, to try and um, diagnose the, the cocktail of influences because the turnaround in the China narrative has been so dramatic. Um, I mean, in 2020, 2021, the Chinese were looking as though they'd mastered the COVID crisis much better than anyone in the West. And, um, and all of a sudden now in 20, really from the summer of 2022 onwards, um, things have really kind of fallen apart. And so it does cause one to ask, well, what could have been the... The trigger. Um, the latest round of American measures against China is is the latest in a in a long series that goes back to the Trump administration, which started with the pursuit, for instance, of Huawei, um, which though it's just one company, is a very very big company. Um, it was China's champion in the telecom sector, champion of five G worldwide, uh, one of the biggest R and D spenders in the world. Now laboring under tens of billions of dollars in losses annually in its cell phone business once you know its flagship business struggling to to replace technological components having to up the ante in terms of research so incurring even greater costs so all of this really hurts and the the measures which have been adopted now with regard to um, american investment in china are also very significant um in in part, I think, piling on to what was already a very uh, negative trend. The U.S. Um, foreign direct investment in China hit a 20-year low last year at eight point, only $8.2 billion. So 20-year low. We're really talking about an absolute collapse. If you look across the board for foreign direct investment, China has suffered a huge hit. And um, the specific targeted measures which are addressing sectors like microchips and AI really matter because it's an odd pattern of the modern Chinese economy that US venture capital at early stages really does make a significant difference to the the tech businesses. But in the end, I think if we stand back from the the sort of, you know, the the thunder of uh, of the economic war between China and, and the United States, there are bigger forces at work in China's slowdown as, as aggressive and as, as damaging as the impact of American sanctions is. I think we do have to look at the pandemic. And here, here I think there's also, as it were, a degree of relief, perhaps, in the analysis of China in that it's early days. I mean, b- precisely because, you know, less than 12 months ago, the Chinese were still 
actively pursuing a, a really draconian net zero policy towards f- for which there's really no direct equivalent in in the West. The kind of the kind of lockdowns that were imposed. Um, it, it's not surprising, perhaps, that the recovery is taking its taking its time. I mean, all of this is a little overshadowed in the chronology of the US, for instance, by the drama of the end of the Trump presidency and then the second phase and then the incredible rollout of vaccines in 2021. I think China does deserve some degree of, of patience. Um, there are certain elements of the Chinese economy, notably its service sector, which are rebounding actually quite well, unsurprisingly, because the Chinese like to eat out. And you weren't able to do that. And now they're doing it in droves. Um, the tourist season is on them. The summer has been a, an exceptionally hot one. So I think there's some compensating news there. But the deep, dark, the, the fundamental problem here um, that's at the heart of China's economic malaise are not the economic measures or COVID, really, but the but the um, housing the housing sector. And it's because of the difficulties in the housing sector that the regime decided to lift the COVID lockdown. And what we're talking about here is we, we've talked, we've spoken about it before on the on the podcast, on the show, is a deliberate effort beginning really in the late summer of 2020 when the regime was really feeling very boisterous and, and self-confident to stop in its tracks the largest single housing construction. I mean, to call it a bubble, I think, really under, underestimates the scale of this. It's like a half a billion people were moved into the cities over the space of a generation. It's the largest single drama of wealth creation the world has ever seen. And the regime in 2020, 21, 21 set about stopping it in its tracks. They introduced a series of credit regulations, which we would call macroprudential in the West, but were, in a sense, anything other than prudent. They were a kind of breakneck policy of stopping the the boom in its tracks they 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 essentially bankrupted one of the largest private developers evergrande and they're still working through that and now it seems as though country garden which up to this point has been treated as the most reputable of the chinese developers is at risk too and these are effectively things like banks so what they do is they take deposits from customers hundreds of thousands of families that sign up to buy an apartment then when they've got enough of those signed up, they start building these giant modern housing projects, which they specialize in. They run up even more bills for those. Um, uh, and then they they speculate that in due course, as it were, they're actually going to sell enough of the apartments and the flow of payments will allow them to make a profit. And, and effectively, they're kind of giant construction banking entities because they do... They do intermediation. They take short-term deposits and put them into, constru- into construction projects and then and pay back over the long run. And the, the scale is enormous. So Country Garden's liabilities right now are $190 billion. So that's on the scale of a Silicon Valley bank or something like that. And there are many, several of these in that kind of order of magnitude. And the regime has d- deliberately brought them down which leaves only the state-owned sector really driving construction. And construction before this hit was a 20 to 25% share of Chinese GDP. So that's really, I think it's, that's really at the heart of everything because something like 70 to 80% of household wealth in China is tied up with real estate. And so if you have a situation in which the market for real estate is breaking, how prices are falling, new orders for apartments are stopping, um, and the big private developers are at risk of actually just going bankrupt and, and um, defaulting on their obligations to what are effectively their depositors. Then you're, you're, you're talking about a very, very serious deflationary force. And that is actually what we're beginning to see in China right now is prices falling, which, of course, makes the problem worse because as prices fall, the real value of debts rises. So altogether, it is undoubtedly a really nasty short run business cycle problem that Beijing is dealing with. But it has it has deeper roots above all in the dominance of the construction sector. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it makes sense that a kind of real estate bubble would be playing a central role here. But then I guess it raises the question of why did that real estate bubble uh, get blown up to the size it did? And uh, yeah, I guess, aside from these kind of, you know, short term shocks, it, it, I, I wonder, does what's happening in the Chinese economy really have more to do with structural issues in the economy, sort of deeper forces at work? Yeah, I mean, the, I think there are two different theses which are out there right now. And, and 
I mean, I strongly favor one of them, but it's, it's probably, you know, we should put our cards on the table. I mean, there are two different lines of Western understanding of the problem. They don't necessarily have to be radical alternatives, but they are quite sharply differentiated in commentary. So one is to say that the problem really is the political shift that begins with Xi Jinping's assumption of power in 2012-2013 and the, and the shift after that towards a more politically, ideologically capricious personalistic regime which undermines the private economy which is responsible for the majority of employment in China at all levels and in particular undermines confidence in the big champions of the modern Chinese economy and those are ultimately the drivers of innovation, productivity, chain, uh, growth and um, uh, investment and that is really the fundamental structural problem. The, the fundamental structural problem is the fact the CCP is still the CCP and she is in charge of it and that's what's really driving the, the 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 difficulties of the economy. Personally, I find that less persuasive than the structural macroeconomic analysis, which says that ownership aside and incentives aside and issues of security, private property rights and so on aside, the really big question is how on earth you could possibly expect an economy to go on running at the pace that China was running with the kind of composition of output that it was that it had, uh, it had adopted. You cannot, after all, repeatedly urbanize hundreds of millions of people, which is what the growth, the Chinese growth miracle was based on. And the consequences of that are visible, you know, really from outer space, actually, quite literally. You can see it from space, the, the level of construction that's gone on and, and the way in which it shifted Chinese GDP uh, and, and the composition of Chinese GDP. And, and it's useful here to make a contrast with the US. So the US economy is a 22 to $23 trillion lump, or well, not lump, it's a, it's a vast churning flow of 22 to $23 trillion of goods and services that are paid for with dollars. And 70% of that flow is essentially animated by household spending. All right, so 70, 70% of 22 trillion. Is, is 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 driven by by the household sector so roughly speaking you know 15 trillion dollars worth of activity driven by private american households the chinese economy is smaller than the us well not by a huge amount it's in the 17 to 18 trillion dollar ballpark this is not purchasing power parity this is in current ex current exchange rates but of that barely more than 35% so the half the share of in the United States is driven by consumption by household spending. And whereas in the United States, investment accounts for only 20% of that $22 trillion of activity. In China, of the $17 to $18 trillion of activity that's going on, 45% is accounted for by investment. So we have two relatively, you know, we have the kind of big brother, little brother kind of economies. They're, they're roughly in the same ballpark, 17 to 18 trillion versus 22 to 23. But the composition of these two economies is, is fundamentally, fundamentally different. One is overwhelmingly private consumption with a little bit of investment, and the other one is overwhelmingly investment with a little bit of private consumption. And, and that's really the, the fundamental difficulty of the Chinese economy. That composition of output has served it extremely well up to this point. It has produced a gigantic growth engine, a gigantic investment-centered economy. If you actually do the math, the volume of investment in China, allowing for the fact that it's such a bigger share of a slightly smaller economy, is twice the size of the investment economy in the United States. When we ask questions like, why are the Chinese able to build high-speed rail? It's because they built a lot of them. So they've got really good at it. Right now in renewable energy, the Chinese are out-investing America, despite inflation reduction out in the Biden administration, at a pace of five to one. Five to one in photovoltaics and onshore wind, right? America isn't even off to the races on, 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 on offshore wind. So the Chinese have got this giant industrial complex that is built for investment. And the question really is, is how would households and why would households put up with this? Because what this means is it's all bread tomorrow and jam tomorrow and not jam now. And the answer, of course, is they don't have any say in the matter, right? It's an authoritarian regime which has productivist investment-driven priorities and in which private citizens and households have really have very, very little leverage over the system. So the entire thing is rigged to generate this pattern. The currency is undervalued famously, so imports are overpriced. Relative to wages, the standard of living is lower than it would be in the West because the currency 
is pegged at an undervalued rate, which then enables them to run very large trade surpluses. They get very low interest on savings, so they are financially repressed, which means that as the Chinese in, engage in huge amounts of saving, they get very little return for it. And there's absolutely minimal social spending. And so the economy is locked in this kind of permanent austerity, permanent growth fixated austerity. It's not Western style austerity, because that generally comes with low spending and low investment. It's a investment centered austere kind of model, relatively speaking. You go to somewhere like Shanghai or Beijing, of course, it doesn't look austere because the growth has been so spectacular. There's very great inequality. And so there's some very high end consumption going on. And we've spoken about this as well. High end Chinese consumers drive the global luxury business. But nevertheless, relative to the scale of their economy, um, consumption and household income and real disposable income are much lower than we would expect by Western standards. And shifting out of that is really the structural problem facing the regime. Okay, we're going to take a short break here and come back to continue talking about China. We're back talking about China's economy, specifically its slowdown, a topic I imagine we'll be coming back to a lot in the coming year or so, I suspect. So what exactly then are China's concrete options for increasing consumption, for increasing demand in the economy? You know, one encounters this discussion in the literature, if you delve into reading about the Chinese economy, it won't take long before, yeah, you hear about this growth model that you're describing, which is investment based in terms of its growth model. And yeah, there is a discussion about the need to shift to a more consumption based system. But what exactly are the deeper political economic hurdles to actually making that shift happen? I mean, they're pretty large, and, and it's difficult, I think, to avoid the impression that quite a lot of the time, this Western critique of China is another version. It's kind of an economic version of a political critique. I mean, essentially, what we're saying is we want households to be empowered. You know, in other words, we'd like them to have political voice. In other words, we'd like them to be, you know, in a more liberal, open political system in which they would express that. They could maybe organize trade unions to resist the exploitative demands of both the political regime and employers. And, you know, clearly none of that's happening anytime soon. On the contrary, the regime is quite repressive. I mean, more than quite, the regime is determinedly and assertively and, and is making greater and greater investments all the time in maintaining its grip. So then the question turns to sort of top down technocratic options the regime might have to from the top down, if you like, um, engender a shift to a growth pattern that would be more sustainable. And, and the there are many, many opportunities for doing that. Um, the question is, how would a regime that is politically tied to this investment model ever persuade itself it needs to make that break when, for instance, it's also battling the United States in a global war, you know, for preeminence, at least in or global struggle for preeminence, at least in, in East Asia. But if you take a purely economic approach and ask yourself, what could Beijing do? Well, one thing it could do is it could enormously increase the social welfare sector and then we don't just mean spending, we mean what the money would might be spent on. I mean, China, despite being a um, notionally a, you know, a communist society, a society ruled by a communist party with a commitment to spreading affluence, um, this idea of kind of common prosperity, um, inclusive prosperity, has public social spending of, of as little as 10% of GDP compared to the OECD average, this is typical for the United States and Europe, of twice that, 20% of GDP. This is spending on social insurance, on, on pensions, on welfare, on unemployment benefit, and so on, where most of the spending would have to happen if you were going to try and step up a Chinese regime to a more welfare-centered one would have to be at the local government level. And the problem is they maxed out, if you like, the credit card, the balance sheet of local government in pursuit of huge investment. And so there's very little room at that level to increase debt further. When we talk about local government in China, we're talking about huge entities, right? So provinces are the size of European nation states. Cities in China have no equal anywhere outside East Asia. There's nowhere in Western Europe or the United States which comes close to these giant megalopolises that they've built. So 
when we say local government, we're talking about huge entities, but they're maxed out. So then the question is, could you go, you know, could you go up the chain to Beijing, which would certainly be an option. Beijing has a lower debt to GDP ratio, but that will be in a sense a further debt driven model of growth and debt. The overall debt level in China is at advanced economy levels for a society which is still at a relatively modest level. So that doesn't seem attractive. So one route to go would be taxation. And another really surprising thing about a notionally socialist society is that China's taxation has really minimal impacts on inequalities. So China has a Gini coefficient pre-tax, which is the standard measure of inequality, which in the United States, for instance, is 0.52 pre-tax. China's inequality is 0.44 by that measure. So pretty extreme. But what's even more remarkable is that after tax, China's inequality as measured by the Gini index is 0.43, whereas US inequality has fallen or been reduced to a lower level to 0.39. So after taxation, the United States is currently a more equal society than China by measured by, as measured by the Gini coefficient. In Sweden, which starts out with a very similar pre-tax inequality pattern to China, 0.44, the taxes are so effective, the tax system is so effective that it reduces that index to 0.29. We'll talk much more about Sweden in a podcast to come. But you see there that there's huge scope for China to actually introduce a powerfully redistributive system that would provide it with revenue flows, which would then enable it to build out the, the, the welfare structure that we could be talking about here. Broadly speaking, standing back from the questions of finance and how you would channel it through the public sector, what China needs to do is to transition from a manufacturing and agriculturally heavy model, which employs relatively large amounts of relatively unskilled low-wage labor, to one which is more centered on high-value services, more, va- more centered on high-valued human services, appropriate to society entering higher middle income standing with an aging population with huge unmet educational needs and center, as it were, and create that as the, as the new growth hub. And, and that's a, you know, saying that is easier than doing it. And it's in fact a problem afflicting almost all advanced societies in various ways. It's just, as it were, the gear shift in China is particularly extreme because nowhere has ever invested as intensively as they have, and nowhere now faces the problem of transitioning 1.4 billion used to economic success to a new model of transition that um, that no one really has successfully modeled, certainly at not scale. There are individual European countries, you could quote the Denmarks and the Netherlands of this world, but they're literally the size of one Chinese, one Chinese middle-sized city in the case of Denmark doesn't even rank amongst the top tier. So they're very small local initiatives of a type that China would need to roll out on a gigantic scale. You know, all of what you're describing, Adam, has me wondering whether there's a chance of China ending up as the next Japan. You know, uh, Japan as a country that famously has had a very long hangover from an asset bubble, again, namely real estate, that burst in the 1990s. And obviously, it wasn't so long ago in the 90s that Japan was seen as the rising threat to the primacy of the United States. And then its economy seemed to hit a wall. And and then there's the fact that China, like Japan, seems to, you know, face the challenge of aging demographics. Uh, China, because of its one-child policy, uh, is a country that is shrinking over time, like Japan is right now. So, yeah. Is there a chance that China ends up like Japan? I mean, I think this kind of comparison can be useful. And there's no doubt if you look at the macroeconomic aggregates, as we've been doing, if you look at the share of investment and so on, they, there, is a, there is a passing resemblance. Also, from the optic of America's decision makers, you know, they're two Asian countries about which America harbors suspicions, which appear challenging. And then I like, presumably the, the fantasy is that somehow China will go away in the way that Japan did. But I mean, beyond that, the comparison, I think, is pretty strained. Um, because at the moment when the Japanese miracle broke, I mean, Japan was not a middle income country. I mean, at all, right? Japan was the classiest, most expensive, most luxurious place on earth um, by quite a large margin. It had a GDP per capita, which was on a par with that of the United States, at least according to contemporary measures with a very overvalued yen at the time. And 
however you measure it, it has stuck in the thirty to forty thousand dollar per capita range ever since. It hasn't grown much since in per capita terms. China is an awful long way away from that right now. I mean, it's you know, on a good day, it's at twelve. Twelve thousand five hundred dollars per head, which places it below the higher middle income category, just outside that category. Now, the the point here is to say, if there is a kind of historical cliche which China fits, it's more the middle income trap than the Japan story. Um, but another way of putting this is that, unlike Japan, China has absolutely enormous development needs which are yet to be met. And unlike Japan in the 1990s, China is in fact still growing. Right, the number that you quoted that started us out 0.8 percent per quarter. If that was quoted the American way, which means that you annualize the quarterly growth rate, we'd be at 3.5 percent, which would be, you know, by Western standards, incredibly healthy. In fact, most analysts, and I think this isn't just hype, but most analysts expect the Chinese economy to actually hit five or slightly above five. Which is substantially faster than anywhere in the West at this point, right? And certainly not in the Japan case, because Japan's Japan's growth actually stopped, and we're quite a long way away from that happening in the Chinese case. As big as the real estate sector is, the service sector is bigger, and it's rebounding fast. And there are large bits of the Chinese economy which are extremely dynamic, much much more dynamic than any any bit of the Japanese economy was in the 1990s. I mean, the, the standout case, which is really going to change the world. I mean, our you know the, the the street scene in most places of the world is the Chinese motor car industry, which in the first half of this year overtook Japan's as the largest exporter of motor vehicles in the world. And of course, motor vehicles now are a little bit old fashioned as a symbol of industrialism, and we speak about smartphones and so on instead. But nevertheless, this is a preeminent driver of globalization, and China is about to enter an entirely new epoch in which it is the dominant supplier. Of Of EVs to Europe and internal combustion engine vehicles to everyone else, notably Russia, in the last six months. And this is a, this is a huge story. If you look at the, and it's linked, of course, to the energy transition. And in the energy transition story, China is absolutely dominant. I was saying earlier on, right now, their investments in solar and wind are running at five times the American level, twice the European and American level combined. And you hear, you know, you read a lot of strategic anxiety and hand wringing in the West about how China monopolizes the supply chains for photovoltaics, for instance, or or wind turbines. I mean, if the West actually built some and installed some, you know, you might actually see some of the resources flowing their way. But China monopolizes that supply chain because it is overwhelmingly the largest builder of of what everyone I think recognizes as the cutting edge of a new industrial revolution. So. The Chinese economy is a long way from being done, I think, in terms of its growth prospects. That doesn't mean Beijing will necessarily be able to realize them. And if it gets stuck in what is called a balance sheet recession, with huge overhangs of debt being dramatized and leveraged in their impact by falling prices, then of course that's very bad for growth. But really, with the opportunities available to it, hundreds of millions of young Chinese still need training. Essentially, the the education system has exploded in the last generation, but that still leaves the Chinese labor force underskilled relative to its competitors. So, the question of labor quality is far, far more pressing and also far more easy to address than the the problem of labor aging. Um, which is the one that's normally cited, right? China is perfectly capable of stretching the retirement age and, and upgrading the skills of its of older labor force, if it can develop the creativity and policy making to do that. But that goes back to the earlier conversation of can they change? Can they change gear in growth terms? I think that's everything depends on that. But China would, I think, be flattered by the comparison with Japan in the in the nineteen nineties. I mean, would that China had those problems, serious as they are. But that would imply a Chinese economy, which in per capita terms will be three times richer than it currently is. So we're quite a long way away from that. So finally, I wanted to ask, what does a slowing China mean、uh, for rivalry with the United States? I mean, does it mean the United States is likely to become more accommodating because it sees China as less of a threat, or is it rather that China might become more aggressive? Fueled by nationalism or resentment, or its countries and the populations betrayed hopes of a of a better future. I mean, how how does this slowdown play out in in geopolitical terms? Do you think? I think that on the American side, there are basically I think three positions currently.、Um, one is the super hawkish one, which is 
um, you know, kick them when they're down and kick them as hard as you possibly can. It's a historic opportunity to cripple a rival that America can't afford to lose. And I think there's a powerful hawkish faction in Washington that is proceeding essentially along those lines, um, counting on this as, a, as an opportunity really to stop uh, the Chinese as a rival. Then there is, as it were, what I take to be the sort of centrist fig leaf position that is most clearly articulated by Janet Yellen on like her recent trip to Beijing, where she you know, insisted that all of the measures that America is taking against them, China's high-tech sector are not intended to cripple Chinese economic growth. Exactly what they are intended to cripple is a little unclear in that case. Jake Sullivan likes to talk about a small yard with high walls, which is the, you know, the segment of the global economy which America intends to define as essential to its national interest and then defend against any rivals, or notably China. So there's that position. And the interesting, the Yellen com- uh, couples that with the rather interesting train of thought, which says that, and because we are very confident about America and its ability to defend its interests, and because we see the problems that you're having, China, don't worry about us taking preemptive action to threaten you with military uh, means, because why would we do that if we actually think we're going to win the economic war? So there is a there's literally a kind of explicit spelling out of the fact that China doesn't have to be really worried about America preemptively launching a war against it, according to the Thucydides trap model, because in the Thucydides trap, America is the weak incumbent that is going to lose to the rising China and must therefore strike. If that, if you actually disagree with that diagnosis and think the American economy is robust, as any spokesperson for the Biden administration, of course, must insist it is, and if, on the other hand, you think that China is weak, well, then the Thucydides logic just doesn't kick in. And then there's a third position articulated by Adam Posen recently in a piece in, um, um, you know, not foreign policy, but the other outlet, Foreign Affairs, uh, in which he argued that... Um, This was a moment for the Americans to pursue not a strategy of raising tariffs and sanctions against China, but an open door policy, which would basically threaten the Beijing regime with, as it were, the defection, the exit of the most talented Chinese, the most uh, wealthy Chinese, um, by playing on the insecurities that Posen sees as the key to the structural problems of China. And... um, and uh, taking advantage of those. And you can see the fourth position, the one I was articulating earlier on, is the Michael Pettis line, which says that actually in the United States and China, a complementary warped political economies with the US being codependent with China in a huge trade deficit situation. And Pettis's vision would imply the possibility of either cooperative or antagonistic and yet effectively functional recoupling or reconfiguration of the relationship between China and the United States. It's not an explicitly strategic vision in the way in which the other three are. But those are the options on at play right now in, in the United States. A, a overtly hawkish, a, if you like, um, centrist kind of uh, 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 moderating an effort to avoid the conflict and a aggressive open door policy, which is, would be the Adam Posen position. I think on the Chinese side, it's in this respect, as in so many other respects, very difficult to gauge um, what's going on. Um, The very least one can say is that one of the risks, and I think this is implicit in the Posen position, one of the risks involved entailed in taking the aggressive line that America is, is that were things to go wrong in China, um, it would be incredibly easy for political entrepreneurs to blame the United States for the damage that ensues. Um, And we're basically setting that up. And in the case of a player like Huawei, with some reason, I mean, it's hard to deny that America basically launched a series, not just one, but a series of surgical strikes on China's champion. And they quite reasonably invoked, you know, economic warfare, indeed, just the images of World War II to describe their situation. That's that's a bad look if what you're interested in is some kind of detente or some kind of Jan- Janet Yellen position. That just basically looks implausible. And Janet Yellen's trip was not very well received in the nationalist media in China that immediately pilloried all of the Chinese economists, just notably a group of women economists she had lunch with for consorting with the enemy. Um, it's too obvious. But I think it would be a misunderstanding on the American part if anyone imagined that at this stage or at this point now, the situation in China is so serious or so grim that anyone is in the mode of panicking like that. Whatever problems that China has, anyone who has uh, 
you know, a current of patriotism running through them will think, okay, well, we get through this and we sort it in the way in which the regime repeatedly has and leave America in the dust in the way in which we appear to be doing in so many areas already. I don't think we should kid ourselves in the West that the, there's a mood of defeatism in China. There's certainly a mood of frustration and degree of bewilderment and depression and the expectation that at some point the regime will act. And you see that in the Chinese stock market as well, which is being talked up very actively right now. But we're an extremely long way away, I think, from a crisis of the China dream at, at that level. I mean, this isn't to say that young people in China aren't deeply frustrated, but they don't, don't jump, I think, to the conclusion that, oh, well, the last 30 years or 40 years of development under the leadership of the Communist Party and the reform era is a bust, right? That isn't, and the Americans were right all the wrong, and, you know, maybe Chen and Men Square should have, should have, should have, should have succeeded. That's a that's a, a fantasy, I think, on the part of Western liberals to imagine that it goes that way. The the majority view, I think, still is on the part, notably also of expat Chinese, that they can't really quite, it's hard, in fact, to justify to themselves being outside the country, which is in the midst of what is still quite reasonably seen as a world historic transformation. And any Chinese person living outside the country is missing out in you know the whole drama of that, warts and all, including this rather difficult phase they're going through right now. Um, but I think that's important perspective to add to any premature celebration of you know the end of the the china dream yeah that makes sense um but we do need to leave it off here we have a couple more weeks of our tour of the world so stick around for that in the weeks ahead but yeah we'll leave it here for now ones and twos is written and edited by me cameron abadi along with adam twos it is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Two's but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Two's listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TOOZE at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. Thank you.